our guest there. Went off. This Go. is this is uh, Dr. D. L. Hall, National Geographic. Is to be having an office and doing research and documenting in, in this area. Don. Glad to have you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, we're we're doing a uh, uh, documentary on this part of Virginia, and we're going to be highlighting. Uh, a section very close to Narrows, which is called Wolf Creek, uh, Route 61, which is probably about 21 miles long. It goes from the town of Narrows, through the town of Narrows, up to uh, Route 77. Uh, this area is, is very ancient. We found a lot of different uh, ancient sites that predate 1500. Now, a lot of the things that we're finding uh, range anywhere from six, 700 years old to 12,000 years old, which takes you to the Ice Age. And when you get back into that time frame, uh, things are a little more uh, archaic, a little more rougher. We have pottery from that is about 4,000 years old. I have pottery complete pieces of pottery that we have found that are uh, 2,000 years old. And we have a lot of different pieces of pottery shards, which I brought a couple with me today. Uh, if you think of this area, you have to think in layers, as in time frames. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. When you come upon a site uh, and only find arrowheads or scrapers, uh, or a few working tools. Nine times out of 10, that was probably a hunting party site. This was a big nomadic area. The ancient indigenous people referred to this as the great meadow because of the fertility of the land. You have the new river right here. And by the way, we are working a site uh, right on the river that is underwater right now, but in the summertime as it goes down, an island is exposed and there was a fishing village there. And we have some, I'm gonna show you some fishing weights that we have found uh, that dates uh, older than uh, 4,000 years old. It's, it's quite an area and unfortunately it's not taught in schools and a lot of people don't even know what they have here. Uh, I came down here in 1993 and uh, I've been here ever since. I wasn't going to stay, but because of the importance of this to myself and other people, uh, I decided to stay and we're really uh, putting a few things together. But the important thing is this documentary that's going to be uh, filmed is going to involve the surrounding states of Virginia, but it's going to highlight this area because we're work we have uncovered five sites, five different time frames. And I'm going to show you some things on this video that, especially pottery, where you can see where it goes from pretty archaic to pretty, you know, cystificated. And uh, you, what that does, what that tells you is just like you and I, when I was growing up, we didn't have computers. We had a phone that you had to put your finger in and turn. Well, now you have a phone, you just sit there and takes pictures, cameras, videos, the whole nine yards. Well, that's civilization advancement. Well, the same thing you have to look from the Ace Age coming forward. These people started to transition themselves from hunters into gatherers into farmers. And these sites reflect all that. So you're going to get different tools, you're going to get different uh, items that reflect what those people did in that village. And I have a few here that I'll, I'll show you and uh, you'll, you'll kind of see what I mean. The Indian, specific Indian tribes, we cannot name, okay? These are indigenous people that either settled here or were coming through in hunting, hunting parties. They use this area for the summer to hunt. If you go to the Ice Age time frame, about 10,000 years ago, you had mastodons around here, which is like an elephant, okay? You had a cave bear, uh, and a short-nosed bear. The cave bear was bigger than a polar bear. It stood about 15 feet high. You had mountain lions, lynxes, bobcats that you have today, but you also had what was called an American lion, 
which is identical to the African lion. You had saber-toothed tigers. So it was pretty dangerous growing up back in them days. Uh, but there are signs that they were here. There are fossil records that they were here. And uh, we have this pretty much recorded. Uh, when you come a little further towards us time frame, not the Ice Age, you have what's called the mountain buffalo. Uh, this area was covered with buffalo. It was covered with two types of elk. You had more of a prehistoric elk, which disappeared close to the Ice Age. It had about a 10-foot, uh, we call them wingspans, but antler span. Then you had the other elk that you, is a relative of what's today. Uh, you had the brown bear. You had a black bear. So there was a lot of food here, including the river, and this is what they all did. There were no horses in this time frame, so the rivers were the established travel routes. You know, when I talk to people that are my age, Alan's age, and they grew up around here, they used to tell me that, oh, we'd find arrowheads when the farmers would, you know, plow the ground. And you don't get excited about arrowheads because usually what that is, it's a hunting party, a fishing party that's traveling through. And then when they make their arrowheads, they would make bags of them, carry them on their side, and some of them would fall. So this is why there's an abundance of arrowheads in certain areas. You'll find a lot of them along rivers. Uh, some of them in flat plateau uh, farm fields. But when what we were looking for was pottery and tools. And when you find that, you know you have something, okay? Uh, like I said, this area was referred to the Great Meadow. Tribes from uh, the north, northeast, Iroquois, Aliquin would come down here. The Seminole from the south, uh, Cherokee, Shawnee, Uchi, and then all the other indigenous peoples that belong to tribes that we don't even know because history is not, has, has not established that. But we've been very fortunate with the five sites that we have. And I'm just going to show you a couple pieces of pottery and what I'm talking about uh, in, in differences. Uh, here's a piece of pottery. I don't know whether you're seeing this or not. Yeah. Okay. And it's called a pottery shard, but it's a piece of pottery that it, you find mostly of. You don't find too many whole pieces of pottery. I have been fortunate. I don't have them with me uh, because they're quite old. I have found two complete vases. Uh, but these pieces of pottery have been found in, at a site. In fact, we found two sites that have very, very similar pieces of pottery. You can see they're thin wall, and they have numerous markings on the side. These Indians would use bark and paddles after they established their bowl and mark the sides of them, and that's how they come in there. Each tribe, not that they had their own markings, but each person did, and each tribe would, would be different, okay? We have some other pieces that you can see are entirely different. They're darker, they're more worn, uh, but more or less the same material. These two separate areas were about 10 miles apart, all right? There are two sites that were working. Now, when you go back 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years, the pottery looks different. Very rough, very thick walled. This is a piece of pottery that I have here. It's the bottom of a bowl, okay? It has been worn down. It came off of a site of a dry stream bed. But if you were to look at this pottery, you can see the bottom, how it was formed, and at the top you can see two, actually two thumb holes where they were, how they put this pottery together. But you can see the difference as the people back towards the Ice Age, how they lived and what their pottery looked like. A lot of the pottery is much thicker than this, the walls. Uh, here again, it's older. Uh, this particular piece of pottery right here dates back to about 13, 1400. Okay, this, like I said, is back about 8,000 years. We're working on a site right now that we established a stream bed, a dry stream bed uh, that's about 8,000 years old, and there's another stream bed underneath of that which could take you back past 10,000, 12,000 years. And we're finding tools and artifacts in there also. So when you go out on these sites, you have to keep an open mind because you're, you're working in layers, time frames. 
And you can have one site that might date 1400, but 18, 24 inches underneath that, there might be another site that dates 9,000 years. So this is the, the hard part about it. Uh, some really cool things that I get excited about, we have a piece of worked mud and sand that they were going to make pottery out of, but they didn't for whatever reasons, but there are two fingerprints right there. And you know, you can put your fingers right in there. What astonishes me, and what I always do when I hold something, I, I wished I could see who was working this and see what they look like. Uh, we don't know about the people because there's no history record. We don't know how big they were, what size they were. I do have uh, some fingerprints, I do have some handprints, and uh, I have a section of handprints that my hand is small compared to what that is, and I have some other handprints that we've got petroglyphs out of caves that are much smaller, okay? Uh, the interesting part about indigenous people, and it's a fact today, even if you go to the active uh, Inuits up in Alaska, up in Alaska uh, or the tribes down in South America, the women, the women made all the tools. The only thing the men did were hunt, make the arrowheads. Uh, the women did everything. In the 17, 1800s, the Cherokee, the grandmother was the matriarch. You might have had a chief, and all his decisions were about war and peace. The matriarch's decisions were how the village was run, any problems with the kids, any problems with the elders. The women took care of a lot more than what the men did. And you can see that in some of the tools. Uh, like I said, the pottery we get excited about because that opens up a whole new situation because you start looking at what these people were. Obviously, these people were gatherers, farmers, berries, nuts, okay? They weren't, uh, not that they didn't hunt because they had to hunt for, for meat, but that wasn't the main staple. I have a piece here that I have found that is uh, seatite. And as you can see, there's two pieces missing. But this is a bowl that I had found at a site and I was fortunate to find two pieces so I, that fit together. And the other two are probably there, we just have to <laughs> locate them. But this dates back to about 1,200 years ago, okay? Almost looks like a turtle shell, though. Yeah, well, you'll find them, and they use the turtle shells for a lot of different things. Uh, I have a few, but uh, if I were to bring all the artifacts, we'd fill this whole room up, I just, you know. But, well, we'll have to go where you're at. Oh, we can, listen, I'll invite you to one of the sites, you know. Uh, pottery, pottery shards, this is another one. You can see it's not as nice looking as this because it's older. And uh, that other piece that I showed you, I have a lot of little pieces that thing, but when you get back thousands of years ago, the pottery starts to look like this, really rough. It looks like stone, actually, but it's not. Yeah, and, some people wouldn't know what that was. Right. But pieces like this, and I have bigger pieces, uh, pieces like this are what the ancient people used. Uh, if you think about it, all they had were rocks and stones. That's all they had. Uh, I don't know whether I could survive with what they had to do to survive. And uh, the tools, it's amazing uh, what you find. Uh, basically, uh, they're not identified specifically per each tool. There's what they call celts, uh, pestles, hammer rocks. It all depends uh, who you talk to and what you have, okay? But all these tools they used were used to survive. Uh, this is a war club that we just found, and I found 10 minutes from here, okay? You can see the shape of it. But if you look at it, you see the notch here and the notch there, okay? Uh, it's been cracked here. They didn't use these for tools. If you talk to the, uh, if you knew somebody that uh, 
had a great grandmother or great grandfather that could have been Cherokee or Shawnee or Uchi or Sarah they would call these headwhackers, and that's basically what they were. They were used for war, and uh, uh, we find them all over in villages uh, of all different uh, dates and times. None of them are as good as this one is. This one is in pretty good shape. Uh, some of them are pretty wore down because we find them next to stream beds, in stream beds where the water has done it. But you can still see them, and there's different sizes, shapes. You can see the grooves in them. You know that, and, and that's what they would look like. Okay. Uh, what kind of stone is this? This right here is just what they call. It's a, a form of greenstone. It's like it's a form of sandstone. Okay, and uh, they used them because uh, basically they could shape them pretty quickly and they would hold their resonance. You know, I mean, it's not, it's heavy, but not as heavy as granite. And it's a stone that's around here. Yeah. You know, you go up to Illinois, where the Iroquoian were, you'll find a lot of granite because that's what's up there, okay? And of course, they, they look different. They're the same shape, but they look different. Some of them are shinier, some of them aren't. Uh, one thing I will say, and I'll say this, if, if you're buying Indian artifacts, and most people look for warheads or tomahawks or anything, and you see something that's really polished, real shiny, it's probably a fake, because they're, they weren't that way. They were not that way. Uh, other things that we have found in, in the villages that we get excited about, because you know you have a village, is beads and shells. Uh, I just found these this morning in the rain. This is a flat piece of rock that's been chipped off that has a hole in it. It's hard to see, but there's a hole in it. They used a lot of this for clothing, for their hair, to hang around their neck, okay? And all these items that you see here were found about 10 minutes from here. These are shells. And here again, you can see the hole. Now, this particular shell is an oyster shell. There are no oysters in Iris, Virginia. There are no oysters in the New River, okay? I have another one. That one is in real good shape. I have another one where the, it's been busted off here. And here again, it's the oyster shell. And then I have one that is a freshwater shell here. That's been, the hole has been broken. When you find things like this, you know you have a village. And then you know basically what direction, where to look, and what to look for, okay? Uh, we have one village, it's just a, it's a hunting encampment. Uh, there is an area, it's probably 15 by 15, and just loaded with uh, arrowhead chips, arrowheads, broken arrowheads, but that's where they sat and made the arrowheads for their hunting party. And, and it was nomadic, they would come down here from wherever. We're right next to the New River, the New River runs from North Carolina all the way up to Mississippi, so the travel back and forth was, was great. We have another creek called Wolf Creek, which we're highlighting. This stream runs all the way over to Route 77, where they found an Indian village, and there's a little store over there with an active Indian village there now. They use this that will connect them to the New River. And uh, we don't know. It's, it was eastern woodland or south, southern woodland, and uh, we know the types of homes they had. The site is right off of 77 where they found it when they were building it, but that's not where the museum is. They, you know, they, they put 77 right over the site, but what they did do is they moved the site to a close approximation, moved some dirt, got some artifacts, and they put a museum up. It's a very nice little place over there, it really is. But it gives everybody an idea how these people live, see them in their homes, how they did their skins and, and hides. Uh, it was nothing more than survival, I'll say that back then. You know. A lot of things you have to take into consideration when you're doing this. The older the artifact, the closer you get to the ice age, the temperatures have changed. You know? The landscape, there isn't a tree around that's standing that was back then. Okay? Most of the trees around here are 50, 60, 70 years old. So when you look at an area, 
you have to kind of take everything in perspective and take all the roads out, all the houses out, and look at it, look at the contour of the ground, and it give you kind of an idea of what they, you know, what they have out there. This is a little nut stone, and you can see uh, how it's been, how they hammered out the top part, and you can actually see where they hammered it out. That's another way you can tell that these are tools. You can actually see the chip marks. And what they would do with these is your acorns and your little nuts and grains, they would have a little grinding stone and just break it up in that and eat it. There's different sizes of this. This is just one of the smaller ones. They would use flat stones, which we have, just large flat stones that would be wore out in from just grinding the whatever they were growing or, you know, the acorns, egg nuts. Here's another little one that's been wore down, but that's a nut stone. You can see that hollow part there. Looks like the end of a spoon if you were to look at it, but the, the rock has been wore down except for the spot in here where the hole is. And here they would take a, a little uh, pestle and just sit there and put their nuts in there. You have to understand that's all these people live for, was survival. But when you find things like that, this is what I get excited about because you know you have something. And what you have to do, uh, it could be right on top, it could be 18 inches below the surface, it could be deeper than that. We try not to, everything that I'm working on is on private property with permission. We don't go in and destroy anything. We work an area till we think there isn't anything else, and then we kind of expand out in grids, okay? One of the best things that you can do is I haven't found in this area a dry stream bed or a wet stream bed that doesn't hold some sort of Indian artifact. And if you want an arrowhead, walk the edges of the river, the flat fields along the river, uh, some of the streams that empty into the river, the dry stream beds, I'll guarantee if you look hard enough, you'll find arrowheads because they're, they're, they are all over. Uh, give you an idea, we just found this. We were really excited about this. And what you have here is something that dates back uh, about 1,200, 1,300 years, about 1,200, 1,300 years. You find a lot of tools like this. This is a tool, this isn't a warhead, okay? But we were working not too far from here in a stream. We're trying to date the stream. And there's an Indian village next to the stream. And there's trees down there that are probably 100 years old. So they weren't there when this was here, but the stream was here. But what had happened is this tree, which is about 75 years old, grew up through the site. And this was embedded between two roots. And the only thing sticking out was this top part right here. It took us two hours to get it out, but we got it out. And there, it's really, and really in nice shape because it has been in that tree for all this time and nobody could run over it or hit it. Uh, this is used for a farming or hammering. Uh, you can see where it has hammer marks up in here. And you can see how they rounded this in as thinner and how they hooked this here. This little hook here could be something where a pole or a limb was used to tie it off and they could have used it for a hoe. And there are tools that are shaped like this that they have identified as hoes. We can't identify them specifically. We just know that it was a tool used for a lot of different things that they did. And they, I mean, I have some that are bigger than that and a lot that are smaller than that. We just recently, the new river, is very, very ancient, and it floods. I live on a river. Sometimes a river comes up to my door. <laughs> it gets scary at times. But not far from where I live, right across, in fact, right across the street from me, there is this little island in the middle of the river. Well, we started when the summertime comes, the level goes down. It's good fishing. We go over fishing. And 
I noticed that there were trees out on this river. And then I started to look back towards where I live and I noticed tree stumps in the water. That just tells me that was land at one time. But we did some satellite imagery and we found out that that was a solid piece of ground about 8,000 years ago. And there was a fishing village out there because we found a lot of different tools. But how we know there was a fishing village out there is we found bone fish hooks and we found fishing weights. That's what these were used for. For nets, for nets and for lines, they would take what they could find, put holes in them, and tie them off, which would hold their nets down. Or like a long line or you know, a line that they use today. You can see this has one here that's been broken off. And uh, we're going to open that up this summer to work on it because that's the only time we can get out there because of the low water. But this area is abundant with, with Indian artifacts. Right now, there's, I, as far as I'm concerned, this is my opinion because I've been working this whole area, we have found more Indian artifacts than Civil War artifacts. And I'm not looking for Civil War artifacts, you know. Uh, we have over 4,500 documented arrowheads, spearheads. I was lucky enough to, at the far side of Wolf Creek, when you get close to 77, a very good friend of mine owns a lot of property up there, and he, there's caves all over this area. Well, you have to understand one thing about indigenous people. Some of them were cave dwellers because of the petroglyphs. We have that. Other ones uh, believed in the underworld, didn't want to go near a cave because they thought that was the entrance to their version of hell. Okay. So when you go into a cave and see petroglyphs, that doesn't mean they stayed there. They could be in there passing through or stayed there for the summer, for the winter. Uh, but I have found two caves uh, and documented that uh, a group of people stayed there because of the tools we found. And I was fortunate enough to find two pieces of pottery buried intact, 100%. And they date back to about 2,000 years ago. So. Here we have these people that wandered through here uh, for how long, nobody knows, okay? But a lot of these villages were used over and over and over again, passed down as time went by for hunting for nomadic tribes. Uh, the only real history that you have is from the, about the 1700s to the early 1800s of Indian history in Virginia. Before the 1700s, we do know the Spanish were here. Uh, we do know, documented in Virginia, that there was a group that came from Jamestown. They heard about the New River. They came down to Roanoke, got some guides together, came here and actually crossed here in Narrows, uh, came across Wolf Creek Mountain, which is on my left, and it's a pretty high mountain. And East River Mountain is here on my right. Wolf Creek itself runs down between them. Well, the Spanish came with these, uh, as explorers, came with these Indian guides and came across Wolf Creek from what I read, got to the top of East River Mountain and decided to heck with it, we're going back because it was too, too, no horses walking, and it's very treacherous you know, terrain. And that is documented. But before 1650, uh, there's no history at all in Virginia, like there is in other states. And what we have found here is the indigenous people, the Native American people that came through here were very, very abundant at times. Some of them were nomadic hunting parties, and some of them were uh, people who stayed here. Uh, there's a transition period about 4,000 years ago where pottery started to show up in the scene. Bowls, cups, and that means that they went from a hunting frame of mind to a farming frame of mind or gathering. And that's right around 4,000 years ago. And then as you come to 
the 20th century and the 19th, in that time frame, the pottery becomes more sophisticated uh, and a lot of different items were used. Uh, when you find a, uh, a site that has pottery, you know you have a village. You know, it might not have been there for years and years and years. It might only have been a summer village. It might have been a wintertime village, but you had a village. One of the things that we have found also uh, at two of the sites, we have what's called a midden pile. A midden pile is a trash pile. That's what we have today. All these dumps around here, uh, if anybody comes back to this area a thousand years from now and covers a trash pile, they'll call it a midden pile. Well, that tells you how those people live, what they ate, what they wore. Anything, not everything rots. And uh, we have found bone. We have found uh, a lot of different utensils that were used. Uh, they did use bone for a lot of different things. I have some... Uh, I uh, have some buffalo bone that we found here, some deer bone we found here, some elk bone that were made into tools. Needles, awls, uh, scrapers, cutters, handles, uh, fish hooks. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I could not, I could not sit here and make those things. I don't know how they did it. I could not, not the way my hands, but even younger, I don't think I'd have the patience. But that's all they had to do, survive. And that's why these tools are so important. Uh, when we get done with everything, I uh, have donated most of these artifacts are going out to three Indian museums. And uh, I think that's where they should go. But uh, no, this area is, is very, very, very highly uh, integrated with Indian artifacts. And let's just say not Indian, Native American, and indigenous people, because we can't put a specific name on groups, especially as you go back into the Ice Age. You have to really get into history a little bit. You have to really get into science a little bit. It's a great, great uh, thing to do because you start forming an understanding. Uh, you start seeing what the climate was like. You start seeing what the weather was like. Uh, the Ice Age was very cold. Uh, the weather here was very cold. More snow, less sun. And then uh, as you got closer, there was a few other weather events that happened. Uh, a lot of animals disappeared. I'm sure a lot of people disappeared. Uh, the state of Virginia has some very strict laws. I will say that. Uh, you don't want to be on federal land digging up. You go on private property, make sure you ask permission. And uh, if you find anything, arrowhead or something, ask the gentleman or young lady if you could have it, and nine times out of ten, they'll tell you you can. The river, you can walk the river, and if you found a piece of uh, uh, pottery or you found an arrowhead on the river, yeah, you can take that. But you don't want to go up into the National Forest digging. They will get you. Uh, there's permits that you have to apply for and, and, and all that. If you find something up that you think is very important, most colleges, most colleges in the state of Virginia have an Indian study group. So there's a professor there that could probably help you out and identify what it is, give you an idea after you tell them the location, give you an idea. It might be something that was from the early 1800s or late 1700s. It could be Cherokee or Shawnee or Uchi, you know, Iroquoian. But uh, the, the Native American history, uh, is, is, to me, very important on the way we live today. And if you go back, and the 1700s and the 1800s were the worst time for the Native Americans, because they lost everything due to the government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody can draw up their own opinions about that, but read the stories to see what they went through, and you'll get more of an idea, you know. But uh, that's it there. That's, I brought a few things to show you. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. No problem. We, get, we can get together. Yeah, uh, we look forward to doing a whole lot more with you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And tell us who you are again. Okay. I'm Dr. Donald L. Hall. I live in Narrows. I've been here since 1993. Uh, I'm, I work with National Geographic. We are doing this two-hour documentary. Uh, we were working on it for about a year and a half, and a very good friend of ours, Gary Bowles, 
nicknamed Poodle, from Upper Wolf Creek, passed away. And he was kind of our connection. So we stopped. Somebody else at Wolf Creek has kind of, kind of stepped into his shoes and, and be with us. But uh, uh, Poodle was uh, a, a big instrument in locating three or four Indian sites. And uh, we're going to do this uh, uh, documentary. And after documentary, it'll be in memory of Gary Bowles. But uh, no, I'm Dr. Donald Hall, uh, working on five sites. And uh, I have a Facebook page. You can go to the Facebook page, it's uh, D.L. Hall. And when you go to that, you know it's me because I have a saber-toothed tiger, mm -hmm. okay? And then there's two groups. First group is titled Indian Journals. And I put on there a lot of Indian history. The other one is prehistoric finds, prehistoric and archeological finds of Giles County. There I post every artifact that we have found. So if you go to that, you can follow us, you'll see what's going on, and uh, you can contact me at any time. Uh, Mr. Neely, who you met earlier, was nice enough. We're going to open up an office uh, not too far from where I'm sitting here. Uh, some of the artifacts will be here to see. I'll be up here uh, three or four hours a day. A lot of people have contacted me, want to see things, come in and talk. So we're going to use that office for that reason. Right. And, uh, you know, everything uh, you want to learn about indigenous people in this area, we have a big chunk of it, I'm sure. But uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate that. No problem. And we'll be seeing you soon on other adventures. Oh, yeah.